Okay, you're on. Okay, great. Uh, welcome everybody to our University of Florida, Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering um, Master's Admitted Webinar for students from India. Uh, we're just gonna give it a couple minutes here to get going and officially start. I can see lots and lots of students coming in. We're already up to over 200 and it hasn't even been 10 seconds. So this is great. We're all very excited that you're here today and we're gonna have a great program for you. <laughs> so we're gonna just wait here for a minute or so. So the numbers level off, we're up to almost 250. Okay, so we're, we're letting everybody uh, come into the webinar here for just another a minute before we get officially started. I see about 250 students that are already signed in in a very, very quick amount of time. So this is wonderful. We have an excellent program for you. So we're just gonna wait about one minute, no more than two minutes here, and then we're gonna get started. Okay, I think it's a good time to get uh, started now. I see nearly 300 students that are logging in. So this is absolutely tremendous. And I know that number is gonna, gonna keep going up. Uh, so my name is Mike Nazareth and uh, welcome to our uh, webinar today for University of Florida and all of our programs, master's programs across the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. We're absolutely delighted to be here today. We have a great program and a great group of individuals between 15 and 20 of our uh, faculty and staff across engineering departments and several of our current students that are joining us today um, that are from India and they're in our programs right now. So this is tremendous. So I just wanna mention one main area as we get started because I know a lot of you um, or some of you have emailed me so traditionally this webinar that we run this time of year is strictly for those who have already been officially admitted to our master's programs uh, for the fall term. And most of you have received your official master's admission. But since we're running a little bit late this year, the, fall, the volume is tremendously high. Um, there's a lot of applications and, and a lot of work to do between our departments and our staff and our UF Office of Admissions. We're running a little behind. So we also invited those that are receiving very ser serious consideration for master's admission. Um, you're in the very last stages, either with the department or a little bit of a backlog in our University of Florida Office of Admissions. So we did not wanna leave you out. So I know some of you have emailed me about that. That means you have not received your official admission yet, but you're at the last stages, and we hope that that will be approved and that that will go through at the end. So we wanted to include you on that content today. So a couple other areas before we get started, we'll introduce everybody and go through a lot of really valuable information. We've set up to two hours, and I know in the past we've gone at least an hour and a half to two hours uh, for the, the students from India. So uh, the first thing is, we will provide you all of these slides and the recordings. So Jacob Stevens in our office will have all of that posted to the website by tomorrow morning. And then I will email you the link where that is at. So don't feel like you have to write down all of these areas. You will receive that. 
The second thing is there's a one poll question. So at some point today, please answer that poll question. The question is pretty simple. Do you plan to enroll in a master's program here at University of Florida? Uh, yes, no, or undecided. You're still deciding. So please answer that. And then the third area um, is there's a lot of you online. We're up to 340 or more students right now. So uh, it's difficult to get to questions unless we use the Q&A. So please ask your questions in the Q&A. You can address them to specific individuals. And again, we're gonna all do introductions here, or it can be a general question. And then several of our counterparts uh, might uh, log in and answer that. So I'll moderate the entire program and I'll try to bring all of our speakers in at some point, but uh, we can't have all speakers uh, responding on every topic that the volume is just too great. So please use those things and uh, I'll go ahead and uh, share my slides now and we'll get started. Okay, um, can everybody see the slides okay? Can someone give me a heads up on that, Mike? Mike, you there? Can you see the yeah, slides? I, yep. I, see, I see, you're good. Okay, good. Okay, so we'll start with introductions and we'll just go in order. Hello, I'm Toshin Ishida and I welcome you to the uh, webinar today. We're very excited that you have chosen to join us. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering, and I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering. And again, I'm Mike Nazareth. I've been in touch with many of you all year, and maybe even some of you the year prior, and I work with helping to bring in the master's and PhD cohort across all departments here in uh, our Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. I am Jacob Stevens. I'm the coordinator for graduate recruitment. Uh, I work here with Mike. Uh, helping to get everyone the information they need and and everyone directed in the right places. I'm a Gainesville native myself, and so if uh, if you want to know about some of the great things around this town, uh, I would be your guy. Um, Martine is going to be joining us a little bit later. She was double booked, so um, she'll talk about the International Center later in this program. I'm not sure is Christina able to make it today. Okay, Chris, Christina uh, had also contacted me and was not able to make it, but we do have some of our um, computer and information sciences and engineering students and they'll be able to chat with you. Hi, my name is Julissa Nunes and I'm the electrical and computer engineering admissions officer. So I'll be here to answer any questions for ECE. Hi, I'm Nancy McElrath. I'm the Graduate Academic Coordinator for SE, which is the Departments of Civil and Coastal Engineering and the Department of Environmental Engineering Sciences. Glad you're all here. Hello, my name is Catherine Pantorno. I'm the Graduate Advisor for Industrial and Systems Engineering, so I'll be here to answer all of your questions. Thanks for joining us today. Is Karen there? We have Karen Ellers. Move it on to me. Yep, we will move on okay. to you. If you show up, then someone cue me and we'll bring them in. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Krista Smith, and I am the graduate academic advisor for biomedical engineering. And I don't think Kimberly DePue is here, so I will be representing both of us today. She is our academic assistant and helps with master's admissions. So feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ade, and I am academic advisor for the material science department. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have for material science or nuclear engineering. Glad you can join us today. Hi everyone, my, my name is Suman Patankar. Uh, I'm originally from Mumbai, India. I'm, I'm currently a professor in chemical engineering and also the master's program coordinator. So please feel free to direct any questions about the chemical engineering program to me. 
Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sajid Mohammed. I'm a current st a graduate student in the EC department at UF, and also I'm a, a board member of Indian Graduate Student Association. So I'll be, I'm here to answer questions, any generic questions and questions specific to EC or anything specific to Indian students. We have some of our other current uh, master students here now from India that are enrolled. Yep, uh, so this is Rishi here. So I am from Industrial and Systems Engineering Department. So uh, I'll be like uh, taking questions related to uh, Indian uh, student community as well as the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department folks. Thank you. Yash or Vernon, are you here? Hi, uh, uh, my name is Vernon. I'm a first year PhD student uh, at uh, uh, ECE department, UF. I came in as a master's student and then converted. Uh, feel free to ask any questions and we'll be happy to help you out. Yeah. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Yash Punge and I'm a master's student uh, in, uh, in the electrical and computer engineering department. Um, feel free to ask me any questions, uh, you know, and I would be glad to help. Thank you. Okay, great. Did the fourth student make it? Vabhav, are you here? Okay, someone just give me a heads up if they, uh, if they make it uh, throughout the program. <clears throat> so you can see we have a great group of individuals here. We can answer lots of questions about lots of topics. So please use the Q&A. I can see that's already going. There's lots and lots of questions that are going on in there. And we're gonna go through the slides now. Uh, every year uh, when we start, I always ask uh, all of the students from India if you would like to help in recruiting the next cohort from India. So these are just some of the students that are here right now that have been helping, they're answering questions, they're attending these webinars, et cetera. And at the end of this, we'll have a slide that has all of their emails as well so that you can stay in touch with them. And I know some of you have already been in touch and communicate with these students regularly. Uh, and I also want to point out that, you know, we have a large cohort and a large community of master students and some PhD students here from India. This is just some of the institutions. When I was looking back in the fall term, so fall 2021, back in August and September, and I went in and I looked at the rosters, students from all of these institutions in India. So you can see that we have a vibrant community here. They all get along well and very well represented uh, from the country of India here at the University of Florida. And we all enjoy that. We think they provide a great contribution to our courses, our community, our research network, et cetera. Okay, so at this time, uh, Associate Dean Toshi Nishida is gonna present some overview uh, slides, uh, both on the University of Florida and more specifically in our Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. Thank you, Mike. Um, so I'd like to give you uh, uh, just some brief background of the university. Um, the University of Florida was established in 1853. Um, it is a very large, comprehensive university. It's part of the uh, United States land grant universities. Uh, and uh, as shown on this slide, uh, there are over 900 buildings. Um, and uh, it's a comprehensive university with 14 colleges and schools and over 5,000 faculty. Uh, we have a very uh, large and diverse student body, a uh, total number of students now over 57,000 students and over 16,000 graduate students. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the College of Engineering uh, later, but uh, the College of Engineering has uh, over 10,000 students uh, within uh, the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. The uh, research uh, that is done at the university is extensive. The University of Florida is known as a Research One University. Uh, and it had uh, over uh, nearly $1 billion in annual research expenditures in the most in recent year. Uh, it is uh, very uh, uh, fortunately situated um, in the beautiful state of Florida. Uh, the university has uh, a, a very uh, beautiful campus. And um, there are also, as mentioned on this slide, uh, some lakes uh, that the university has uh, both on campus as well as off campus. Next slide, please. 
In terms of um, COVID, uh, some of you may uh, be uh, wondering about what the COVID situation is. Um, the number of cases of COVID uh, has decreased significantly uh, and the uh, uh, restrictions uh, have recently been, lift been lift lifted. Uh, university has a, a lot of uh, uh, protocols and programs in place to help anyone uh, who has a need. But uh, fortunately, the situation uh, has uh, greatly improved. Next slide, please. So I'd like to tell you uh, about you know, some of the, uh, the values uh, for the uh, Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. And uh, we're very excited that you're here today uh, uh, and, uh, and as admitted or uh, in the process of being admitted uh, that uh, we'd like to uh, uh, tell you about what we hold uh, important. So we believe that engineering and computer science can transform the future in areas which are critical to society. And as we know, there are a great many challenges facing uh, the world today. And we believe that the, the solution to many of these problems will be led by engineers, and particularly a new engineer. The, uh, the tagline for the College of Engineering is called Powering the New Engineer to Transform the Future. And the new engineer is one who's both technically excellent and also capable of leadership and innovation. We believe that this world-changing innovation uh, requires a workplace and culture that is diverse and inclusive, and the college and the university are committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide, please. So why choose the Herbert Wertham College of Engineering? The Herbert Wertham College of Engineering is a comprehensive, collaborative, and uh, uh, rapidly growing college. Uh, it is named after an alumnus, Dr. Herbert Wertheim, uh, who has contributed uh, a large uh, gift to the universe, the, the, the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering, uh, naming the college uh, and initiating a transformation that's led to the hiring of many uh, talented faculty and leading to uh, uh, great uh, improvements uh, to the infrastructure. The college includes every engineering discipline except architectural and pet uh, petroleum sciences. Uh, and in terms of infrastructure, I'll talk about uh, these. Recently, we added the uh, 61st uh, engineering building called the Wertheim Laboratory for Engin Engineering Excellence. And we're currently building the 62nd building, which is the new data science and information technology building. In terms of uh, innovation, the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering produced uh, recently more licenses and options than uh, many top universities uh, in the US. And as I mentioned, the College of Engineering is, is very diverse uh, and is listed here, uh, it has received a number of, of accolades in terms of its diversity uh, of students and faculty. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the, uh, the, the uh, departments and degree programs, uh, these are listed on the, uh, on the right. Uh, we have over 300 faculty, 16 degree programs, and 11 departments. And the total number of students, as I mentioned, is over 10,000, uh, of which uh, over 2,000 currently are master's students. And we're very excited that, uh, that you are considering the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. Next slide, please. The rankings for the University of Florida continue to rise. Uh, the progression in terms of ranking is listed uh, on this slide. And most recently in the US News and World Report, uh, the University of Florida uh, now uh, is in the top five of all national public universities. Uh, and uh, this is just a testament to the outstanding faculty, staff, and students at the university. Next slide, please. Uh, and this slide shows the company uh, in which the University of Florida uh, keeps. Thank you. Next slide, please. This, this table shows uh, the number of, of uh, students from India um, who uh, were recently uh, admitted. And, um, and, and this describes them in terms of our programs um, across the college, numbers of masters and numbers of PhD students. Uh, next slide, please. I mentioned the infrastructure. And so uh, this is a, a moving uh, slide. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the 61st building uh, was recently completed and we're building the 62nd building. The College of Engineering uh, is, is uh, well endowed with outstanding uh, facilities uh, for research uh, and teaching. Next slide, please. 
The most recently completed building is the Herbert Wertheim Laboratory for Engineering Excellence, uh, which opened in the fall of 2020. And this facility includes state-of-the-art uh, biotech lab, uh, prototyping labs, uh, as well as collaboration spaces and uh, state-of-the-art classrooms. Next slide, please. A new, a new initiative that the University of Florida launched recently is the AI initiative. And it uh, was uh, basically spearheaded by a partnership with NVIDIA. Uh, and now currently the University of Florida houses the fastest AI supercomputer in higher education. Uh, for those of you who are interested in technical details, uh, the uh, high performance uh, computing facility, uh, which is known as Hypergator, uh, three uh, has NVIDIA's most advanced AI software, which integrates 140 NVIDIA DGX A100 systems uh, and uh, delivers over 700 petaflops of AI performance. And this facility is available for students and faculty to use for uh, both uh, classes as well as research. Next slide, please. The 62nd building uh, that's currently being constructed, the, the picture on the lower right, uh, is a picture that was taken um, within the uh, past uh, couple months. And the picture at the uh, upper right uh, is a picture of the completed uh, structure uh, that what it will look like. And this is the Data Science and Information Technology Building. Uh, it will be known as Malakowski Hall, uh, uh, named after uh, a ECE alumnus, Chris Malakowski, and co-founder of NVIDIA, uh, who's contributed uh, to this uh, facility. It represents a $150 investment and will be home of the AI University. The University of Florida is infusing uh, basically uh, classes as well as research across the university with AI, uh, developing new AI curriculum. It'll be the headquarters for the computer information science engineering and electrical computer engineering departments. Uh, and it'll include a number of uh, innovative facilities, including hands-on labs for VR, uh, AR, AI, cybersecurity, uh, IoT, and GPU. And it's currently on track for completion uh, next summer. Next slide, please. So uh, I'd like to um, just summarize that uh, we were very excited that you're joining us uh, and we very much look forward to answering questions and I look forward to seeing uh, many of you here this fall. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Toshi. Uh, so our director for the International Center is double booked, so she will be, she said she would be back around 10 or uh, maybe a few minutes after 10 o'clock. So here. we'll come, oh, are Hello. you here? Yep, I made it. Okay, great. Perfect timing. You're up. Great. Yep. Go ahead and introduce yourself as well. <laughs> All right. Thank you. We had in a meeting right before this that was booked after I already reserved for this, so I apologize for being late. So my name is Martine Angran. I work with the F1 international students here on the university campus. And we have a team of about 12 people to help our students. So with that, I will go ahead and go into our slide. Um, next slide. So we have a lot in, of information on our website and therefore we can't go through all of it, but we wanna make sure that you at least have the preliminary information in order to one, get your I-20, then know about your visa and making sure you maintain your status. So we're gonna to touch upon specifically the estimated startup cost, the I-20 process, the F-1 visa and maintaining status. But I believe this website, this uh, webinar presentation will be shared with you all, or if you simply scan the QR code, you'll be able to visit all of those links on our website. Next slide. All right, so estimated startup costs for graduate students who are going to be starting in fall 2022 as international F1 students, that cost is 49,908. These numbers are subject to change at any time, but it usually is set one year in advance. So the for your I-20, which is what is a sampled on the right-hand side there, you will be required to show $49,908. If you do have an award of some type, then that can reduce the amount that you need to show. For example, you may receive the Achievement Award, which is $4,500 per year, which then means you would have to show $45,408 for that year, okay? We do advise that you have available with you immediately $15,000 to $20,000 
because you're going to need to pay tuition within two weeks of classes starting. And you're also going to need to perhaps um, put down a deposit first month and last month for your apartment. Perhaps you're going to need to buy a US cell phone. You're going to maybe decide on buying a car. You're going to do a few things that are going to require money up front. So we do advise that you have available somewhere between 15 to 20,000 to be to get started here with your life in the US. You do have to declare anything that is over $10,000 to customs. So please make sure to do that in order for there not to be any issues with that. Once in the US, it's relatively easy to set up a bank account. Um, our campus bank account as well as Fargo, the Bank of America and Campus Credit Union, which are near campus are, usually, are also very easy to work with because we have communicated with them about what our international students need to start a bank account and they'll be able to help you without you even having a social security number, which is usually required of um, citizens or permanent residents who are opening a bank account, but they're aware of what our international students need. For the I-20 process, when you apply to UF, you use a certain email in your application. That is the email by which we will communicate with you throughout this entire process of your I-20. So please make sure that you are checking that email. Once you're admitted, you, your department will submit an I-20 request for you. We will then contact you within about a week from when your department submits the I-20 request. If we haven't contacted you, that means we probably did not receive the I-20 request. So just um, perhaps check with your department, but typically five to seven days after we receive the I-20 request from your academic department, we then send you instructions through our automated portal, the IS portal. We're going to review the request that your department submits for you, and the instructions will be sent to the same email address that you use to apply to UF. Make sure you're checking your inbox, your um, junk or spam box, because depending on what uh, Yahoo, Gmail, uh, Hotmail you use, it may have gone to your spam folder. So please make sure you check that. Once you receive those instructions, please log into the ISS portal in order to complete the questionnaires, upload your required documents, including the proof of funds, your passport, and your certificate of financial responsibility so that we can then move on with your application. As you go through the questionnaires, at the bottom of each page, it will say save and submit. Each of those questionnaires are submitted individually. However, to submit your application in itself, you have to scroll back up to the top and hit submit application. Otherwise, it will not be submitted to us and it will be sitting there without us ever knowing. Make sure you submit each questionnaire and then scroll to the top to submit your application. Your F1 advisor will then receive your application and will review that. If everything is great, they'll be able to reach, issue your I-20. If there are any issues, they will follow up with you. Please know we are working with over 3,000 incoming I-20 requests. So thank you for your patience as we go through all of our applications. Okay. Um, once the I-20 is issued, I'm sorry, one slide back. Once the I-20 is issued, it will be uploaded in the IS portal. We no longer mail the I-20. It is uploaded in the portal and the email you receive will give you instructions on how to download that. When you follow those instructions, you must actually print it in order to have it with you when you attend your visa appointment and then when you travel to the US. You cannot just show it electronically, you must print it. Okay, next slide. Now, once you have the I-20 that you download from the IS portal, you are required to pay the CBIS fee. It is the I-901 fee that you will pay, and then you will complete the DS-160 on the US consulate website where you will apply for the visa in order to secure your visa appointment. The DS-160 is the visa application form. It is not provided before you receive your I-20. So you're going to get your I-20 first, you pay the CBIS fee and then you do the DS-160. I am recommending that you keep a copy of the DS-160 after you complete, save and submit it. We've never asked for this in the past, but due to new regulations, we are being asked to make sure that our students upload the DS-160 as part of check-in. So please make sure that you download and save that DS-160 within 30 days. You will only have access to it for 30 days. If 30 days passes and you no longer have access, there's nothing else you'll be able to do about that, okay? So please make sure you keep a copy of that. 
So you schedule your F-1 visa and you attend the U.S. Uh, you attend the appointment at the U.S. Embassy or consular office. Among other documents that the website may advise you is required, you must definitely have your printed I-20, printed admission letter, your printed proof of funds, and bring your original passport with you. Once that's um, completed and hopefully your F-1 visa is approved, you then schedule your flight into the U.S. and you must complete the mandatory UFIC online check-in when you enter the U.S. If you do not complete the check-in, we're not able to confirm with the U.S. government that you have arrived as an F-1 and reported to the university, and therefore that will be a status issue for you. So please make sure to complete your online UF check-in again in the IFSS portal after you arrive in the U.S. And last but not least, for what you must do as soon as you arrive is register for classes. Information regarding course registration is through your department, and then as far as making sure you maintain your F1 status, we have that information on our website and we'll cover that a little bit today. Arriving in Gainesville, make sure that you have your I-20 with you at all times, your admission letter, and at this point, your F1 visa and passport on your person. Do not pack it in your luggage, do not lose it. Before you travel, we actually recommend that you go ahead and scan a copy of these documents into a Dropbox so that if for some reason you lose the I-20, then you can access it from your Dropbox and print it again. The I-20 is still in your IFSS portal, but just in case it's a little difficult for you to remember the instructions on how to download it, then you will have it saved in your Dropbox that I'm sure you remember how to get into that very easily. You can only enter the U.S. up to 30 days before the program start date on your I-20 as an F-1. So if you're, your I-20, if you're admitted for fall, will say program start date of August 24th. That will allow you to enter the U.S. as early as July 25th. You are not required to enter that early. And in fact, you may not want to enter that early if you don't already have your housing. So just plan accordingly and make sure not to enter more than 30 days in advance. Do not enter the U.S. on a B-1 visa or a other type of visa just to arrive early. Because if you do, you must then leave the U.S. to come back in as an F-1. So please make sure to remain abroad until you, one, have your F-1 visa, and two, are inside of the 30-day window in which you may enter the U.S., and then make sure to enter the U.S. before the first day of classes. Keep in mind, as far as housing, um, off-campus apartments, which is where a lot of our international students will live, they are likely not available until probably first or second week in August because students who are currently living there and are moving out, the apartment um, will need about a week or 10 days for turnover and cleaning the apartment for the next tenant. So keep that in mind as you consider your travel time to the U.S. Next slide. All right, so the mandatory, mandatory check-in process, as I mentioned, is online. You are required to complete that process, and you should do that before the drop-add deadline. So once fall classes start, there is a five-day drop-add deadline, at which point we're going to be looking for everyone's check-in and everyone's registration. So please make sure that you complete that. UF also provides a critical dates and deadline calendar. So we give you the first few dates right here, but please go to the calendar in order to see what all the critical dates are. Um, right now you're in the registration timeframe. So if you're planning on attending UF, you could look into your courses for registration at this time. There's no late fee for this portion of, for registering during this time. First day of classes are August 24th. And if you're not registered by the 22nd of August, then any registration thereafter is considered a late registration. So at least get one course added if you're still thinking about what other courses you'd like, because as long as you have at least one course added, you're not charged a late fee after the 23rd, as long as you always add courses before you drop courses and finalize everything before August 30th. And then fee payment deadline for this fall is September 2nd. So we provide all this information in the beginning. We're not the academic department. We're not the registrars, but we know that our students need to make sure they meet these deadlines because if you don't meet those deadlines, you then are going to affect your F1 status. So please make sure to meet those deadlines. Next slide. Maintaining F1 student status. As a graduate student, you are required to register 
for at least nine credits each fall and spring semester. Out of those nine credits, at least six credits must be physical presence courses, hybrid or physical presence for those six credits. The other three credits can be 100% online or they can also be in person or hybrid. So you must register for at least nine credits every fall and spring until you reach your final semester, at which point you can take whatever is left to graduate and no less than three credits in the fall or spring, which must have physical presence. If anyone is admitted in the summer, then full time for that summer is six credits, again with that same maximum three credit online, but summers are considered vacation subsequent to the semester in which you are admitted, okay? Employment, a lot of our students are interested in working on campus. All F1 students are automatically allowed to work on campus as of the semester in which you're admitted for 20 hours or less per week. So you don't need any special authorization to work on campus. On campus is UF proper, meaning UF payroll, or also what we have on campus is the Gator Dining, also known as Aramark, or e Follett Bookstore, also known as the UF Welcome Center. Those are the, and on um, the O'Connell Center, the O'Connell Center here on campus. Those are the main three to four areas that you can work 20 hours, up to 20 hours per week without issue. You're not able to work 20 hours in two minutes. You are restricted to 20 hours. If one of your colleagues can't come in and you're being asked to take their shift, you must make sure that their shift does not cause you to go over 20 hours per week, okay? You cannot work off campus at all in the first academic year. And if you do find a job off campus, whether that's being called an internship, paid, unpaid, practicum, uh, rotation, co-op, whatever it might be called, if it's off campus, you need to have authorization from our office on your I-20 before you can engage in that activity. It's not a verbal authorization, it is a written authorization on your I-20 specifically for that company or after you graduate for the ability to work after you graduate. For, um, for training that is within your program during the time that you are still in your degree, it's called CPT, Curricular Practical Training. And for training or employment that is after you complete your program, it's called OPT, Optional Practical Training, for after you graduate. So please, this is very much a brief version of all the things that you need to know. Please know that when you apply for the F-1 visa, you're telling the government, I understand what I'm applying for, I understand I'm responsible for my status, and I take responsibility for all in which I engage while in the US as an F-1. We are here to help you understand that regulation, those regulations, but of course, you must go to our website, read that information, you must contact us, let us know what you're not understanding and what we can help you understand. But we give all of this right up front because this is where most of our students can get into trouble. So we wanna make sure you're aware of this as we're here to help you maintain your status, but you reach out to us and we'll help you however needed. Looking forward to you all being here. I do have one more slide. One more, yep. So if you have any questions, you do have a specific F1 advisor. Your F1 advisor is based according to your surname. So for example, I see a surname of uh, Crashto. So Crashto would look to work with our advisor surnames A through C. Um, if your last name like mine is Anne Grand, again, that would be with A through C. So look for your specific advisor on our website and you may contact them. We also have virtual office hours and you can see what our schedules are for virtual office hours. If you have any questions, please reach out to them directly. Um, click on the I-20 process on our website for you to learn a bit more about that. Again, all the instructions that you need for how to obtain your I-20 or is going to be in the instructions you will receive after your department submits your I-20 request for us to, for you to us. And last but not least, if you get nothing else from this, is one, maintain your status, and two, make sure to submit your application. So each questionnaire is an individual part of the application. When you click submit at the bottom, it only submits the questionnaire in your application, but then you need to scroll back to the top and click submit application in order for us to actually receive that and to help you with your I-20. Again, congrats if you've been admitted and we hope to see you here in the fall.
Okay, thank you so much, Martine. So that's a lot of detailed information for all of you, lots of good stuff. So if you have specific questions, uh, Martine is here now in the Q&A, uh, address those questions and, and she'll get those answered. Again, we are gonna be providing these slides and the recordings tomorrow. Um, Jacob will have all this on the website and I will email all of you with the link. Uh, so don't feel like you have to, to write all of this down. Um, and then also be sure to answer that poll question. There was one question at some point today. So we're gonna move on to some other topics and areas now and give a chance for some of our department representatives to speak, maybe just give a, little, a few highlights about their programs and some of our current students that are here. Um, so earlier you saw some of the rankings for University of Florida as an institution, as a public university, but we're also ranked very well in our specific engineering and computer uh, departments, uh, computer engineering and science departments. And you can see virtually every single one of them has a ranking in the top 20 for the public universities in this country. So that's great. Uh, so we'd like to let each, uh, each department just give an update. Um, Behab, Mishra, did he make it? Is he here? Okay, I'm gonna ask some of our ECE students to help out. I know some of you are interlinked with your friends and maybe even some courses in our CISE department, um, just to provide some updates, your impressions, some of the things the students always wanna know about are some of the same questions you had when you started here, like how and when do you register for courses? What's the course selection like? Can I take courses in other departments? You know, how many people are in a class, uh, et cetera. What's the difference between, like if you take a course in India, now you're here at University of Florida, how does that kind of translate the differences? So if some of our ECE students would like to talk just for a little bit about that, Sajid, Vernon, Yash, uh, Rishi, any of you? Or Rishi's an ISE, so we'll, we'll hold off. Uh, sure, Mike, I'll go first. Okay. Uh, so I'll talk mostly about the registration of courses. So it's pretty clear and straightforward for the ECE students. They just need to go and register on one.uf. So one great resource for ECE students is the Graduate Guidelines book, which keeps updated almost every year. Go through that book, you'll see a you know, good amount of information about courses, registration, the track, you know, depth, breadth, the requirements, how to you know get a degree, the requirements, number of credits to take. Everything is clearly listed in the uh, graduate guidelines handbook. So it's a good start for you guys to look into that and then uh, continue with the course registration. In case if you have any questions, you can always reach out to current students, which are seeing here, or any one of, of the students through LinkedIn or through your mutual connections. Anyway, there are plenty of students willing to help in every possible way. And uh, regarding the department, yeah, we have almost like eight, seven to eight different, you know, research areas in which you can, you know, try, work out, see where you, where your interest lies in, which which field you want to do, and there are plenty of, you know, job job opportunities for you. And for EC, I would say uh, their jobs are only increasing considering how the, you know, EC related market is growing, especially in chip area. So do not worry about the jobs or internships that tons. It's just that you need to apply on the right time and keep applying until you get one. Uh, and then I would like the other students to talk on any other. Yeah, yes, yeah, sure, Vernon, can you uh, comment anything about CISE? I know you're an EC and we'll get to that in a little bit. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I would just like to add to what Sajid said. Uh, the registration uh, process for EC is very easy. So. So basically, once you have your uh, one dot you have set up, uh, you just need to go to register for courses and then uh, choose courses which you would like to take. Uh, but yes, one important thing what I would like to mention here is uh, uh, to follow uh, the track. Uh, just be very careful what track you want to uh, you know join uh, your at UF because you don't want to mix up uh, like two three tracks and get confused on what to follow. So there, there's a link uh, which I've just put up uh, in the chat uh, which would definitely help uh, everyone to just follow that and then uh, that would be really easy for you i mean your journey throughout uh, with courses uh, would be uh, comparative easy if you just follow uh, particular tracks and yes uh, to contact professors uh, which also helps you in understanding the coursework sometimes you just come here and then realize that uh, this is way different than what you expected so it's always um, good to have prior knowledge of what course you want to pursue and whether it's the same thing what you're thinking of so yes yeah thank you 
Okay, Vernon, do you have some comments? Yeah, and uh, in the chat, I see that most of the concerns are related to about uh, the classes being full. Uh, I'm sure that you will be accommodated, if not in this semester, in the subsequent semesters. Courses are offered like uh, in every semester, so you will get ample opportunity. Yeah, so for CISE, and I know a lot of your computer science or data science, you won't have to worry about that. A lot of these courses, uh, the registration now might be for current University of Florida students staying on for the fall term. So for the new students, it takes place over the summer and sometimes even into August. And they have lots of courses to choose from. And then as they get full, they add up more sections. They just keep opening more sections. And one thing students always ask, if I'm in a CISE department, can I take a course in ECE or uh, ISE or another area? And you can do that. You have some mandatory courses you have to take, but there is some flexibility to take a few other courses in other areas, and you'll be guided along the way uh, for that. And it's a very exciting time for CISE. I actually just heard that um, data science is now going to become an official master's degree of its own, and that'll be starting this next year or the year after. It's already, I just read that it received all of its approvals, and I know many students from India are very interested in that, so we'll, we'll keep uh, providing you more details on that. Okay, so we're going to move on to chemical engineering, and uh, Suma would like to uh, provide an, uh, an overview or highlight any area about that department. Hello everyone. So the chemical engineering department uh, has about 130 graduate students, half of which are master students, and we encourage master students to participate in uh, research in our department. And they do play a very important role in the research activities that happen. So we are a pretty large department. We have 27 faculty members and active research in areas such as uh, new materials, nanotechnology, uh, biomolecular and cellular engineering catalysis, uh, fluid dynamics, uh, and, and, and environment and sustainability. And for the master's students, we also have a, a lab class, which is designed to provide exposure to new emerging areas and chemical engineers, uh, for chemical engineers, such as semiconductor processing, as well as uh, emerging technologies in the biomolecular engineering area, such as CRISPR. Uh, and that is one of our most popular classes. So you don't have to decide between a thesis and non-thesis right now. You can come here, uh, explore your options as, as far as research is concerned and make that decision as you go along. If you have any more questions about the coursework, please direct them to me. Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, we do have a couple flavors of the master's degree, which some people have talked about. Some are straight courses, some are thesis. Most of the students are here for two years. It's four semesters, the fall semester and the spring semester. They're 16 weeks each. We do have the summer semester. We don't see as many students for that. And I know the master students are looking for internships throughout the US with companies, right? So you have some options for that as you move along. Some of you are admitted to the EDGE program. That's the online program. That's usually the same two years. Uh, there are times with students in either track may finish a little bit earlier. Uh, most especially if it's already our own undergraduate students at UF and they continue on. But uh, the online takes about the same amount of time because the classes are recorded live and you watch them live or they're posted on the website and you watch them later that day. And they just work out a system with you to proctor the exams. These students never move here to Gainesville. So, so we have both of these options. I would say 80 to 90% of our master's students come, they live here in Gainesville and they're on campus. And you know, this 10, 15% are in the online studies. Okay, so let's move on to a couple more department updates. We always have some students uh, from India in biomedical engineering and we're always looking for more. So Krista. Hello again, everyone. Um, so, as many people have mentioned already, um, within our department, we have a thesis and non-thesis based masters. Um, we do, non-thesis master students are required to uh, complete a capstone project. And I know there's a lot of interest in internships, and that is one of the more popular ways that you can complete the capstone project within our department. You can also do an academic research project that does not result in a thesis. So even if you decide not to pursue the thesis track, you can still um, conduct a research project. Um, and there are some other options too, like a clinical immersion or an in-depth literature review project. Um, we 
our master's students work with um, all of our faculty across the department, across all of our research areas, which are biomaterials and regenerative medicine, biomechanics, biomedical imaging, modeling and data science, and uh, molecular and cellular engineering, and neural engineering. So there are a wide variety um, and of things to do and people to work with, and it's a very interdisciplinary department. We are, we are also very closely tied to the College of Medicine here at UF. We have a lot of faculty who collaborate with physicians and clinicians, um, and a lot of our students interact with med students as well because our master's and PhD students are allowed to take, actually encouraged to take, um, graduate level courses in the College of Medicine. So those would count towards your degree requirements and they're considered what we call specialized electives. Um, we are a relatively small department. We have um, a relatively high number of faculty, but we've kept our um, department on the smaller end. We have about 150 graduate students. Um, about 70 or so of those are comprised of master's students. And because we're a little bit on the smaller side, we have a lot of events in our department that are department-wide, so we try and um, create a community atmosphere within our department and very inclusive of all of our um, faculty, staff, and students together. So if you're admitted to our department we can't and have accepted, we can't wait to see you in the fall. If you haven't yet and still have questions, please reach out to me. Um, if you're still waiting to hear about your admission, excuse me, your admission, um, don't panic. Um, there's just um, a little bit of a backlog that we need to push through and we will get um, an answer to you as soon as possible. So thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Krista. So from one of the slides earlier that uh, Associate Dean Toshi Nishida had presented, you could see that we, we have a good amount, a great community here in engineering. I think in the fall, it was about 620 or 630 students from India currently in our master's and PhD programs. And at least 80% of that was in the master's programs. Uh, so, so we have lots of students here uh, all the time. Uh, and I know we definitely have some students from India in our SE department. And I will let uh, Nancy highlight uh, a few areas there. Hey everybody, or good afternoon, evening, wherever, whatever it is, time over there. But um, anyway, um, it's early here for me. Um, but we have uh, many opportunities in our department, as they do in others. Um, we have the masters, and most of our students in SE, um, probably about two thirds are masters, and the other one third are PhD students. A good many of our students that do matriculate in masters end up getting their PhD in um, either the Department of Environmental Engineering Sciences or the Department of Civil and Coastal Engineering. Um, we have many new um, research opportunities available, especially coming up with AI. Um, and that is really primarily throughout our construction program, uh, structures program, and um, transportation and environmental engineering sciences. So we're re really very happy about um, the activities that are going on currently because we are keeping up with what's happening out there in the world today, being that we're the engineering school of sustainable infrastructure and environment. Um, we also have a very new center for coastal solutions that one of our faculty members in environmental engineering is the director of. And so we're really happy about that situation as well and hope that you would possibly get involved in that once you are here. Um, I, I really have nothing else to share. If you have any questions, if you're out there and you are from civil, please contact me. Uh, I am the only staff member currently in my area. So I am doing the job of two people. So I'm a little stressed but we're keeping up with things. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Nancy. So um, Nancy made two great points there. I just wanted to highlight those. One is master's to PhD. So every year we have students that come here from India in a master's program somewhere in engineering or computer science, and then some of them stay on for the PhD. So you all have that option. Uh, uh, when you get towards or midway through, you let the faculty know, you let the department know, uh, that you'd like to continue on, and that is an option. And 
every student doesn't continue on in the same department. Some students might be in computer science and engineering for their masters and then move to PhD in civil engineering or in electrical engineering or another area. So those are possibilities. And that brings up the second point. Um, earlier, we talked about AI and being the AI university. So this whole initiative is being directed and integrated across every engineering department and every college across campus. So for the many of you that are in computer science or data science, you really have a leg up if you want to continue on in a separate area or have collaborative uh, research going on across multiple departments or units on this campus. This is really the time like the time we've, we've not seen before. So uh, master's admissions, most of you have been admitted. Uh, the others, you're in the final stages and we hope that you will see that soon. But this is some of the reason why over 4,200 master's applications just in our engineering departments and I actually put this slide together, you know, like six or eight weeks ago. So I imagine that number is a couple hundred higher. We've admitted about 1900. Actually, I think it's closer to 2000 now across all the departments. But as many have said, uh, you know, there's a backlog. Uh, we're sorry about that, but the volume is really high and we're getting more apps every year. So we're working as fast as we can. It's not just routed through one person or one area. It has to route through several stages. And, you know, of course, each stage can be a, a potential holdup. So we're working through that. There will be hundreds more that are admitted, I guarantee. We've admitted between um, about 20, 2,200 to 2,400 in the last two cycles. So that's where I think we'll probably end up uh, for this year. The GRU was away for many, but we anticipate 800 to 900 plus. That would be the, the, the number of new master students that would be enrolling across all departments for next fall. We think we're going to be on track to stick with that. Okay, so we have our electrical and computer engineering department. You heard uh, from some of the current students, but now let's talk to one of the more senior uh, staff with a lot of experiences here, um, Julissa Nunes. Hi everyone. Um, just to piggyback a little bit of what Mike was saying, we are working on getting um, these admits out to you guys. Um, once we submit our decision, it doesn't just automatically get released. It does have to go through the Office of Admissions. And that's when everybody says, you know, that their application checklist gets uh, the green tick marks. Um, got a lot of emails about those. That doesn't mean that we're able to release it right away. It also has to go through international admissions before it's sent back to the department for um, to be released. Um, so we are working on that. I tried to also answer for some of the computer science uh, students who were asking the questions. They get we get a whole lot of applications. Like computer science gets about twice as many as we do. So. Christina is, is definitely working on those. Um, there's not a specific deadline to get the um, admissions out, uh, but we're working on it as quickly as possible. Um, for the ECE to PhD um, stuff as well, um, I can send you guys a link for ours, um, but you are allowed to switch from MS to PhD. Uh, if you meet certain requirements, you do have to get an advisor and you do have to have a certain amount of credits completed before you're eligible. Um, I'm here if you have any other questions. Okay, thank you, Jalissa. Uh, so next up, we're going to highlight um, our ISC department. So we'll start with the staff, Catherine, and then Rishi, you're in the, the program. Maybe you can speak after. And I grabbed these pictures off the website for one of the uh, India student events. Maybe you can inform us exactly about that too when you speak. So we'll go to Catherine first. Thanks, Mike. Um, so yeah, like many other departments, the ISC department has a master's non-thesis and thesis track. Uh, you do not have to decide right away if you want to pursue a thesis, um, but we have research areas in data analytics, health systems, human systems, supply chain and logistics, in operations research. Um, the department is also exploring some uh, possible areas in quantitative finance, so um, that's been pretty popular as well. Um, our curriculum at the master's level is very open-ended, so we do allow ISC students to pick which courses they're interested in, um, and then there is room to take elective courses within the College of Engineering or even outside of engineering uh, related to statistics or programming in some way. 
Um, so the curriculum is different. Um, I do suggest that students reach out to me and they communicate with me on what their interest areas are, or again, if they're um, thinking about pursuing a thesis because you will need a faculty advisor and an additional committee member. Um, yeah, so I'm here to answer any questions. Please let me know. Again, thanks for joining us and um, I'm happy to work with you all. So uh, yes, uh, hi all, uh, I'm Rishi. So uh, I'm currently uh, um, pursuing my uh, master's in industrial systems engineering. So my experience here has been uh, really overwhelming. So uh, the best thing is the class size, I would say, compared to the other universities that offer this course, which is very small. And uh, the specialization, especially if you uh, any one of you are like uh, looking to uh, enroll into the specialization of operational research, healthcare, and um, analytical oriented, like that is data analytics, I would prefer uh, like this is the best option to be here because there's lots of research and there are some really exciting uh, faculty members who are ready to uh, offer uh, a role to work along with them to uh, see the real world technologies uh, and how it is shaping up. So you can have a really hands-on experience with those technologies. And um, and we have a lots of uh, industry connect happening every weekend, like there is a, um, a society known as Informs. So they used to uh, have a graduate seminars every weekend almost and all the leading um, operation research oriented uh, researchers from across the world or the globe they tend to participate there and share their work and give us uh, insight or like uh, how it is going to work or help us uh, shape our uh, thoughts so i would uh, highly recommend this program whoever has uh, got in here thank you rishi do you know this event for these pictures Yes, uh, actually, uh, we recently uh, had a holy event that got concluded that is just one or two weeks before uh, it was a really excellent uh, event. So it's a festival of colors. And uh, thanks, uh, ISA and IGSA for hosting this event. So there are uh, they are planning to host many of such events. So I think there is a really good uh, student life. And uh, every weekend we used to have the get a nights event as well. So which you'll be covering up as we go ahead in the the social life part, I, I suppose, yeah. So it's gonna be exciting for the people who are gonna come in here. Great, thank you. Yes, we are the Florida Gators. So you'll hear a lot of things that are Gator this or Gator that. And every year, many students, especially from India are asking, you know, do you really have the Gators on campus, like the real alligator? We do have some in some of the lakes, but it's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, you'll, you'll enjoy when you, when you come over. So the application deadline is April 15th. So it's coming up. You need to accept or decline online. That connects it to many other systems throughout campus for next steps. But for those of you that have not received official admission yet, then that deadline will get extended. You get a minimum of two weeks after you receive it. And a lot of times the master's students, it ends up being May 1 onward. But if you, if you have received it and you know sooner, you certainly want to let us know sooner by April 15th, and many, many students do. But do try to complete that process online. And, uh, you know, we have students that accept all the way throughout May and even some throughout June. If you're an international student, it really needs to be by then for all of these various other uh, visa things or, um, you know, for the F1, that can cause some complications. So there's two, two more departments for some updates and then we'll go over some other areas about the town and fun things to do and career stuff, et cetera. Um, Karen, did Karen Ellers make it for mechanical? I am here. All right, so go ahead and introduce yourself and then give us an update. Hi, I'm Karen Ellers with uh, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. I am a graduate advisor for both our online edge platform and for the um, online masters um students um or the on-campus master students both um international and domestic we are a team of two so there's another advisor jeremy hall and he and i share and overlap with those responsibilities for advising we're happy to welcome you to mechanical and aerospace engineering if you haven't gotten your official um admission or your status still says pending please feel free to reach out to us um, using our website has an admissions contact and we'll be happy to share uh, where you are in the process. We still have some admissions decisions that are rolling out 
over the next 30 to 60 days as uh, faculty continue to make decisions on uh, new applicants and or we have uh, room available for additional um, admits. So be sure to let us know if you're still waiting for your decision. If you've already received your decision, we will be sending you information on orientation shortly. We're happy to meet with you either online or in person, or you can wait until the orientation, which happens just before the fall term closes. And we have a whole event uh, scheduled for students to meet faculty in their um, areas of focus, to discuss curriculum, to discuss employment opportunities, um, to discuss internships and what that looks like, and as well as your focus area and career goals. So we have a good program set up for you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. All right, great. Um, and the final department update is with material science and engineering, which also includes nuclear engineering here at UF. Yes. Hi. Uh... Welcome again, everybody. My name is Aday, and I'm with the Material Science and Engineering Department. And as Mike said, we, we house the Material Science and Engineering as well as the Nuclear Engineering Program. And as many uh, other departments have, have mentioned, if you are still waiting for your admissions decision, uh, uh, please bear with us. We are actively working on those. Um, you can send us an email if you would like to know the status of your application. Uh, maybe you're still waiting on some documents or things of that nature. So feel free to send us an email. Um, but again, we are actively working on those. Um, if you've been admitted, congratulations and be on the lookout. We will be sending you information regarding the orientation, which will happen prior to the start of the uh, fall semester. Um, We'll send you some additional information for those that will be arriving on campus, um, as well as so that we, those that will be taking classes online. Um, we have the uh, online program through the uh, UF Edge um, program, so students can take those, uh, those classes online. Um, the master's program have the uh, thesis and non-thesis track. Um, all our master's students are usually admitted um, as non-thesis, and then if you are interested in, in the thesis track, you just have to let us know and we will make that switch for you. Um, we also have research opportunities with our faculty members. So if you're interested in any areas of research, um, you're allowed to reach out to those faculty members because our faculty members are actively seeking students to do research with. So if you're interested in a specific area of research, feel free to reach out to, to the faculty member uh, for additional information. Again, we are uh, excited to have you all join us. Um, Again, be on the lookout for any information that we'll be providing to you. And if you have specific questions about the uh, curriculum and things of that nature, feel free to send us an email. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. OK, thank you. So for costs, you saw some of that uh, with uh, Martine and the F1 visa presentation. So you can see for tuition that you know, this is a comparison to the other top 10 schools. We're currently ranked as number five for public universities, but we're actually number one when it comes to most economical for tuition and most economical for place to live, for cost of living. And you can see here's two metrics and two uh, that you can look at, but some of these pla other places are much more expensive. So I'm going to let... Um, some of our current students, maybe you can talk about what it costs to live here as far as apartments and rent and those kinds of things versus India. Sure, I'll go. Uh, so, so generally the Indian students reside in four major communities and it's off campus. So people generally prefer off campus uh, housing for various reasons like closer to Indian community and closer to Indian grocery stop or you know, uh, stops or uh, commute to campus. And you know, uh, this, this stuff that off-campus housing provides compared to on-campus housing, the cost of living and you know, the social gatherings that you have with your community. So generally the top four housing communities where Indian students generally reside is Stone Ridge, Nice, Nook, and the Greenwich. So Nook gonna be shut down for the fall 2022. They are under renovation. So primarily you'll be having three options. I mean, the major three options where you'll see Indian students residing. Uh, and yeah, so the commute to campus is very easy and the frequency of buses is very high compared to other places from the these three places. We have good number of buses, almost one bus running for every 
10 50 10 minutes all the way from the bus stop uh, this bus stop of this place is to campus rights union so don't need to worry about commute and it's closer to uh, as i said indian stores and you know food indian food which you might need or indian groceries and other big food uh, you know grocery stores like walmart Publix, you know whole foods target that's why all again all of them are like five minutes distance or five minutes to travel through a bus so that's the main reason why you see indian students inside of the campus and then the cost of living depends so i would say it's a good estimation to consider an average of 600 dollars including rent and groceries assuming you're sharing your room if not i would say 800 dollars would be a good figure to start with as in yeah, taking the whole room for yourself which includes utilities and paying for utilities groceries everything else first three months cost would be a little ex you know it might be a little more than an average cost because of the things you might need to buy and set up your apartment few you know uh, few security deposits you might need to pay for grus and your apartments all of that stuff but post three four months everything is like fixed and standard and it's much more cheaper compared to many other places across the us as the slide shows even the you know campus tuition fee is much reasonable very more than less just reasonable it's you know it's like very good compared cheap and good compared to many universities so one other thing which i wanted to say apart from housing is few few people might feel once they come to campus once they start their you know work you might feel it's a little stressful but i would say a few might feel it's stressful, but at the end of the day, everyone would feel it's worth worthy to be, you know, get a degree from University of Florida. That's for sure. Okay, thank you, Sajid. So I want to talk about the funding for a second. So you've seen uh, all the advertisements about the Academic Achievement Award, and many of you, some of you might have already received that. If not, you will be. So this is guaranteed. If you are coming, if you are admitted to a master's program, any department here, and you come to University of Florida and you're enrolling full time, which all of you have to be for your visa, then you will receive this. We do not have any limits on this. So we can give as many as we like. So we give it to all of the non-Florida residents, students from other states and other countries. So all of you should qualify and it's $4,500. So basically, we will reduce your tuition amount $1,500 for each of the first three semesters. So that will happen. If for some reason that's not happening, let us know and we'll go into the system and correct that for you. The, the main area where I see where there can be errors is in CISE. So some of the CS majors have been admitted or registered in the College of Liberal Arts and Science. So there are some CS programs in both engineering and both the Liberal Arts College. This offer is only valid if you're a college, Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering student. So if you're in the other category and you want to switch, then you need to let Christina Sapp know, send her an email, and she can switch you over if you've been admitted. A lot of those classes are the same. I think the main difference would be what do you want your final master's degree to say? That you're an engineering graduate or a liberal arts college graduate? And I think most of those students do want to be listed as an engineering graduate. So if that's if you did something in error there, it can be a little confusing, then please let us know so we can correct that. This, this that offer is not valid for EDGE. If you're doing the online studies, it's already discounted tuition. So we can't apply this towards it. And if you are a current US student and you're in-state resident, we cannot do this because you're already receiving the cheaper tuition amount. So you heard a little bit about careers. I'm gonna let some of the departments that offer uh, careers talk in a second, but we, we offer a campus-wide um, career uh, uh, fair for everybody. So. Um, Yash or Vernon or Rishi, have you attended this? Would you like to talk about this? Uh, yeah, so like if you like, uh, so most of the uh, job opportunities happen uh, on campus during the career fair. Uh, so you are expected to uh, have different sets of resume and then also uh, present yourself you will probably get one minute uh, to be speaking with recruiters from all these companies so you are expected to talk about your profile and then they will ask you to uh, apply online so you are expected to go online and apply and then uh, yeah okay um so 
has uh, Yash or Rishi, have you attended this? Oh, yes, sir. As uh, Vernon said, uh, uh, this, uh, the industry connections is really great at UF. Uh, they keep uh, having like uh, career fairs uh, once every semester. Besides that, there are also other opportunities to interact with uh, uh, industry personals. Uh, we, there is a good lot of exposure uh, is what I feel. Uh, you just have to stay connected uh, with uh, the UF Career Center and that helps you get connected uh, with uh, the industry with the industry basically uh, uh, the also you could also get your uh, resume and other things uh, checked you know and then uh, that also helps you you know uh, in uh, finding a, a career of a placement basically so yes yeah yeah i also learned that about a year and a half ago and i think it's taken place longer than that i just didn't know that they also have professional attire so uh, the students dress up in their suits or nice uh, dresses or uh, business outfits to meet with the company reps. And if you don't have that, they, they, have, uh, they have all of this uh, in the Career Connection Center and they will let students uh, rent them out to wear them. It doesn't cost anything. And I thought that was just very impressive. So it's nice that we have the Career Connection Center. Uh, they have a team of staff and their only goal and mission is to help all of the University of Florida students to get jobs and to get internships and to prepare for their careers. That's all they do. And they help everybody, the undergraduate, bachelor students, the master students and the PhD students. But here in engineering, we take that a step farther and many of our own engineering departments host something in addition to that. So I will let some of our department reps tell about the additional things that they do. Thanks, Mike. Um, so in BME, we have two uh, main events. So we also have a few smaller ones that I haven't mentioned here, but um, the two big ones are Industry and Alumni Connect, where in the fall, we hold Alumni Connect and we invite alumni from our department from all different levels, bachelor's, master's, and PhD to uh, present to our students about their career paths. And that can lead to a variety of things. If it's just getting advice on um, what you want to do going forward, if it's getting advice on um, how to apply to a particular company or how to get your foot in the door with a particular agency if you're looking for a government position there are so many opportunities that talking to somebody that uh, went through our program um, and is already in a position that you're interested in um, there's so many opportunities that that can open for you industry connect is somewhat sim similar although they're not necessarily alumni they are industry reps that come in to um, in our building, biomedical sciences building on campus for an event in the spring where they set up tables and network, network with our students. They will give brief overview presentations about their companies, about um, any current employment opportunities, any internship opportunities they might have. And most of the time, these are relatively local companies. So if you're a master's student looking for an internship for the summer, for example, don't want to go very far from Gainesville, um, one of these companies might be a good option. Um, some of them are a little bit further away. It just depends on if they're um, open to traveling to Florida for a one to two day event or not. Um, but we also have virtual events. Um, we have seminars what we call industry insiders which um, could be companies from a little bit further away that will present to our students virtually about their opportunities so it's not just regional companies we are um, connecting students with um, people all across the country so um, yeah that's a little bit about our um, career opportunity events thank you okay great thanks I know a lot of you are computer science and they have their own fair. Here's just a sample of some of the companies that come. So these fairs, um, they may be uh, a day or two before the main University of Florida uh, career fair or a day or two after. So if these companies are already in town or sometimes they choose to do it at a different time of year so that they can just focus on these particular students and these majors and not be wrapped up with the whole campus-wide effort. 
But I know they do this at least two times a year and they have many, many that come looking uh, strictly for those students. Um, SE has their own event and I'll let uh, Nancy talk about that. And everybody, um, yeah, our event is a, a wonderful two time a year, two times, once in the fall, once in the spring. Um, it has actually grown from the first year we had, it was 16 years ago with six employers. And we are all now up to 60 employers at our event. So it's really awesome. Um, very busy night, it's only a three hour event, um, but the employers and all about 300 to 400 of our students participate in that event out of the 700 um, departmental and SE wide. That's undergrad and graduate students. The employers that we invite all look for both bachelor's and graduate level students. Um, and they offer internship opportunities as well as full-time employment. Many of them have international firms as well. So um, we encourage students to do their homework prior to the event so that they can see if um, there are subsidiaries, international subsidiaries of any of these companies, because even if they don't offer employment here in the U.S., they might have, to, to international students, they might have a subsidiary uh, area in um, Europe or in China or somewhere else, and um, it's really a, a good opportunity for students that are international to actually um, gain employment with that particular company. So we encourage the students, as I said, to do their homework prior to the event. And we have um, a really good uh, networking opportunity for our students in that regard. Okay, great. Uh, ISC has their own specialized event? Yes, we do. Um, same as Nancy, uh, basically a great opportunity for students to learn about internship opportunities or career placement in general. Um, majority of our students do um, pursue internship opportunities during their master's program and the career fair is a great way uh, to um, research what's out there. We do also encourage students to do um, a little bit of research ahead of time or in advance of the career fair. Uh, we typically have it every fall term, so in September, um, and I will communicate all of that with students via the graduate student listserv, uh, but definitely uh, very beneficial and something that we absolutely encourage students to attend. All right, and I'm sure there's many other things taking place uh, throughout the college uh, separately in the department. That's just a sample of some. So uh, we have a lot going on with graduate student life. Um, Sajid mentioned some of that, so I'll see if some of the other um, students or even uh, department reps would like to talk about uh, some of the graduate student life here. Uh, yeah, so like Sajid mentioned, uh, you have a lot of Indian restaurants and uh, if you live within the four communities, the Niche, Stone Ridge, the Nook, uh, um, these communities, you don't feel like you're living in the U.S. So uh, you have a lot of Indian students around. And yeah, I would, um, I mean, it's fun to like interact with students from all communities, I'd say. But uh, yeah, for those who are missing home, I don't think you are going to miss home if you stay within these communities. You also have uh, Indian restaurants, Indian stores. So yeah. Uh, so Sajid is a member of the Indian Graduate Student Association, so I think it would be best for you to chat about that. Uh, sure, thank you, Mike. Uh, hey, everyone, again, in case if you missed my introduction, my name is Sajid. I'm a part of IGSA. It's, it stands for Indian Graduate Student Association. So uh, what we essentially does is we kind of try to be a home away from home to Indian graduate students mostly the incoming students because that's where they, mo they need most help. Current students are already well settled and they know whom to reach out to for any kind of issues, but the incoming and the prospective students is where we try to you know, put our work and efforts. So generally we kind of you know, provide help with all the things, not necessarily just one thing, all the things post your admit, 
be leading to uf related to ufic careers job prospective housing you know picking up you guys picking you guys from airport or temporary housing in case you aren't able to you know be a primary point of contact in case of any emergency arise arise and then we do a lot of fun fun events also like what how we, we, just like how we are seeing the holy pictures here and then we have uh, diwali and then we have box cricket which is due this saturday and i hope people people good number of people turn up to that and then we have you know general body meetings and your know, few career related events or webinars and few smaller events like just it's it's a more of you know uh, making a community uh, you know making so that everyone feels you know within the community if no one is left over and then the stress is managed at the same at the same time while achieving academic goals and you know or what you wanted to be at the end of the of after you getting a degree so it's more about you know being a home away from home you'll be seeing more tons of information about this on our whatsapp groups which will be sending soon we are trying to work out something with your fic and hope it works out and we are also trying to see other means through which you can reach out to you guys for the links one of the official igsl links are out as of now which i'll be sending out soon maybe with the help of mike which we did for last year or last couple of years so stay tuned to us you will also find out a ton of other information about igsl on our official website you can find that our organization on your student organization club and the website there or on social media and from there you can always reach out to us for any query any information you might need or anything which you could help to make a better decision or you know make your life better at gainesville or uf okay thank you sajid so we have uh, some campus housing options uh, some of the students live on campus uh, graduate student housing focus but as many of the students were saying, most tend to live off campus. And there's a few apartment complexes where a lot of the students from India tend to set up their own community. And, and many of them, or most of them, live in those areas. So for on-campus housing, you need to check. Uh, we're kind of going through like a 10-year phase of renovation on this campus to build one new uh, residence hall. I mean, there's more than 20 plus residence halls on campus. But the others, many of them are older. So each year they're kind of renovating over a year or two, many of them, but this is a 10 year process. So some of that is taking place. And I know some of the focus is to add some graduate student housing in the future. But again, this will take uh, a little bit of time. This shows some of the uh, off-campus housing and some of the ones that they were talking about, especially in the Niche and Stone Ridge area, uh, where you see a lot of the Indian students. But there's many places and ways to search. There's many uh, websites and referrals. And of course, the India students always uh, with the Graduate Student Association try to help each other out and provide referrals if you, if you stay in close contact um, with them. Uh, so there's lots of fun things to do that we've talked about some, but sports is a big thing here at University of Florida, the Gators. There's both competitive sports where we compete against other uh, colleges and universities in the US and try to win national championships and be the best, uh, the best in the whole country. All, we have pretty much all men's sports and all women's sports. But then we also have for fun intramural sports where you just play against other students and it's not as competitive and you just wanna have some recreation uh, to do when you're not studying so hard or, or taking exams. Uh, Gainesville is a nice community, and I'm going to let, I'm not from here, I've been here eight years, but uh, Jacob is uh, born and raised, so I'm going to let him talk about it. Yeah, like, uh, like everyone's been saying, it's a great town, a great area of the, the country, that's for sure. We are at a very comfortable latitude that we, uh, we don't get too cold in the winter. We, uh, we do get pretty hot in the summer, I'll be honest with that, but uh, enough of the sea breeze from the ocean on either side that, uh, that cools us off a good bit. If you do like the beach, as folks have said earlier, we have uh, just an hour-ish drive from, uh, from either the Gulf, which is going to be your, your calmer waters, where you're going to have a nice, more comfortable uh, splashing around time, and uh, also the Atlantic, where it's going to be uh, a little bit rougher if you, if you enjoy anything like surfing or playing in the waves. Um, Gainesville itself, uh, we have plenty of fresh water swimming around uh, places around here. Uh, most of our lakes are, and our rivers, for that matter, are spring fed. We are right on top of the Florida aquifer. And so 
the Gainesville area is basically the source of all of our local waters. And, and that's given us a, a huge abundance of nature preserves and nature trails, uh, both in the city uh, and outside of it. You'll, um, you'll usually notice as you tra travel around Gainesville that there's gonna be a, a nature trail pretty much a between every, uh, every couple of destinations you go. Um, now, if you do prefer getting your physical activity and exercise indoors in the, the comfort of air conditioning, that's uh, it's definitely something that, uh, that I enjoy myself. Uh, we have plenty of gym facilities here at UF, um, but one of our best facilities is going to be our Lake Wahlberg complex, uh, and that's essentially a just a private lake out there uh, near town that is exclusively available to UF uh, students and other affiliates. And so um, that's that's a wonderful place to kick back and definitely relax after an exam. Um, now, if if nature is not as much your thing, but you're more interested in the uh, the, the urbanized lifestyle or or indoor activities, we um, our student center for one, uh, we call it the Rights Union Building. Here, it's a, a multi-level spot that has uh, plenty of activities, arcades, uh, bowling, ping pong, you name it. It's available for you. Also, most of our student living areas have their own little activity center. Uh, we have tons of arcades and uh, nightlife in town. There's plenty of theaters. Um, art is huge in Gainesville, and so if you enjoy going out to a museum uh, or just enjoying a nice little art walk, that's that's definitely a good place for it. Um, and we have a, a ton of history features, uh, everything from our UF Museum here to some of our, our local historic districts of town where you can, you can still see some of the old cobblestones um, and also plenty of, uh, of facilities very near to town and even some inside town uh, that feature some of our Native American history. And, and some of those um, uh, settlements that you'll see go back thousands of years. And so that's, that's a lot of great things to, to keep your mind busy and active uh, when it's time to get your mind off of schoolwork for a few hours. All right, great. So that gives you a little more of an idea about Gainesville, as, as most of you have probably never been here. And we're definitely a college town. I mean, we have 57,000 students, and then you can see the population of the town. So we are by far the biggest entity, the biggest thing going on in Gainesville. So I asked some of the current India students to put these together. So they're great with this. They always have a WhatsApp group. Um, they informed me about Hangouts Dialer last year. I can't say I still uh, have any idea what that is, but I, I presume it means something to you. Uh, but this is a, a great way with the WhatsApp group to communicate. Uh, we, we have one for all the incoming students and then some of the departments have their own like CISC where we have some of the most number of students in the ECE. So they'll continue to update. That's a good way to learn more about what's coming and ask questions and ha have the other current students help you. So I encourage you to do that. Um, again, you'll, you'll be able to get access to these slides uh, tomorrow. Uh, there's some other social media areas, which are things for our office, where you can find out more information about uh, things that are going on. And some of you have probably already been uh, reviewing some of those. So here's uh, the email addresses again. These are all of the individuals that were on the webinar that was here uh, today. Um, so you'll be able to have those if you do not already have those. I know some of the staff have probably put those right in uh, the Q&A or the chat today so that you'll have access to those. Here are some of the graduate students from India, the current students that are helping out and they wanna help out. Some of these are on the webinar today. Others are individuals um, that are in the middle of class. They're attending class right now, but they still wanna help out the next group of students that are coming. So you'll have access to all this. So I think we've talked a lot today. We really have covered a lot of topics. So what we would like to do now uh, for the last few minutes is if there's any other questions that you might have, or maybe there's some questions that really need to be addressed uh, again from the Q&A. So if you have questions you want us to talk about uh, right now in front of the whole group, please put those in the Q&A. And I will leave this area uh, for Jacob to, to review and, and let us know which topics that we need to discuss. All right, definitely a lot of really good questions coming in through the Q&A. 
Um, now, a good bit of them we've, we've discussed elsewhere here, and we are going to be posting this recording on our website on Friday morning. Um, so one, one question that, that pops up a lot in regard to the, uh, the application deadlines coming up and also how that intersects with the official decision that comes up on the portal. When does the letter arrive? I know that our offices uh, are a bit backed up. We've, we've, uh, we appreciate your patience on that. Um, yeah, do, sure. Do, so um, for so some of you have already received um, your official admission. So if you've already received it, then your deadline is April 15th. You want to let us know by April 15th, unless you just got it in the last day or two, because you do need a minimum of two weeks. But if you know your decision, then, then there's no need to wait, right? If you haven't received it or you're going to be receiving it, um, you get a minimum of two weeks from when you receive it, but the department will likely put a deadline in there for you, like, okay, your deadline is May 1st if you're just receiving it, or a little bit beyond. But I think the general sense at University of Florida is all of our departments and our graduate staff are pretty flexible, so just communicate with them. Once you receive it, send them an email and, you know, can I have till this time or what's the time? and they'll be sure to get back with you. The biggest one in the backlog is certainly CISE, and that's because they receive probably half the applications for the whole college. That's such a popular area for, for students from India. So that backlog becomes a little bit more. So please work with us on that. There's also a good bit of I-20 questions as far as uh, both for H-4 and funding sources, like is a loan okay or so? So um, Martin, do you want to address the highlights of what keeps coming up over and over? I've been copy pasting almost the same answer to a lot of <laughs> questions in the chat window. So the um, first thing, H-4 is not related to the I-20. H-4 is a different visa status that is a dependent of someone on an H-1B. We do not monitor H-4s, H-1Bs at all at the International Center. If you will be attending UF as an H-4, you will not receive an I-20 unless you wish to a change to the F-1 visa status. Uh, proof of funds, if you are coming without any funding, you will show 49,908. If you have an achievement award, you will show 45,408. Yes, you can apply for a loan if the loan has been approved and you upload the approval letter from your bank, we can consider that. You cannot use provident accounts such as a retirement account that you cannot, that your parent or sponsor cannot readily Re, um, withdraw from and a letter must be included with that from the bank that says so and so can um, withdraw any amount at any time with or without penalty. If we don't have such a letter, you will not be able to use any such type of funds. Liquid funds are typically funds that are in a checking account or savings account. Was there something else? Um, a lot of questions about the I-20. Your department must first submit an I-20 request for you. Within five to seven business days, you will receive instructions from our office, plus or minus because we are working with an average of 3,000 incoming international students. Not all 3,000 will come, but however, we have to send instructions to all of them until they decide if they're coming to UF and therefore apply for the I-20. The sooner you submit your I-20 application, the sooner you will be in line. You might be number, I mean, at this time, we already have 300 applications pending. So you might be number 301 or you might be number 2099. So therefore, please submit soon. We don't have a deadline by which you need to submit. However, you need the I-20 to then secure your visa appointment and then come into the US. So the sooner the better. Um, I'm running off my head here. Anything else was a common question? I think I think that's good for this topic. That, that it's a never ending topic, right? <laughs> okay, Jacob, any other pressing questions? There's yeah. also other, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, there's also one question about uh, if the Q&As are going to be posted. So I'm not sure. Um, the last time we did this, I think we were at 450 to 500 plus questions. So that's a little overwhelming. So uh, probably we will not be posting the Q&A, uh, mainly the slides and the recording. So yeah. OK, thank you. Yep. Uh, we've also got a good bit of interest in resume building. Naturally, that's that's what we're here for. Uh, things like TA positions, RA positions, internships, industry connections here locally. Uh, 
anyone want to go running with this? Because I know so we have plenty. So for uh, everything for the resume goes through the Career Connection Center. We talked about that. We had the slides, and then uh, many departments have their own individual ones. But we do have some uh, students that have questions about potential funding for a TA or an RA. So I will let if one or two departments want to give a response to that, maybe Jalissa and another one, uh, because some of the departments tend to have very similar response to that. So is there any possibility of a TA or an RA for a new incoming master's student? I guess that would be the, probably their main question. Um, so for the ECE department, it would be rare. TAs are very rare. We do have an application for them. Those are distributed by Dr. Robert Fox. So you can feel free to apply, but those are very rare. Um, what's a little more common is this, uh, the re research assistantship, but those are mostly reserved for PhD students. It's not impossible for a master's student to get one, but we don't award them ourselves, the faculty members do. So what you'll wanna do is contact the faculty member that's in your research, your area of interest, and see if they are currently recruiting. And then they can let you know if they're interested. Okay, thank you. Does anybody other department have a different take they'd like to express? Yes, uh, with respect to the industrial and systems engineering department, uh, as uh, it was for the EC department, it's going to be competitive or not much of opportunity for the incoming master's students with regard to the TA or RA in the first semester. And one more thing, as uh, shared before, RA is reserved for the PhD students, probably. And uh, the TA, you have opportunities in the second semester, maybe because some professors feel uh, you guys should have uh, taken the course under them in the previous semester and have had a good grades or for the for you guys to be qualified for that position or else have a good research under your uh, belt so that you can approach for the opportunity to the professor and uh, there might be a possibility of graduate assistantship and if it is available and which is rare but it will be communicated across the entire industrial department uh, Catherine will be doing that and uh, once she uh, shares the information you guys can uh, apply to uh, like using the link and uh, based on your uh, profile uh, and they will evaluate you and further they will uh, like complete the process for you to um, enroll for that position. Okay, great. Jacob, any others? That's the that's the bulk of it. A lot of specific questions, but I feel like some of our some of those are, are better served for our students one on one with their their advisors and, and our other specific offices. Okay, great. So we've gone a long time now. So what we're going to do at this point is um, we usually wrap up. Uh, I'm probably not going to go down the line and have everybody giving uh, parting words, but I'm going to let our four graduate students uh, that are here today, if you just have any last uh, last minute words of advice that you would like to tell the students that are online, they've either all been admitted or very close to being admitted, and some of them have decided they want to come here to Florida, but some are still deciding. So if you have any last advice, and then after that, if any department reps would like to give uh, parting wisdom, that's fine, but I, I'll just ask, I won't go down the line. So we'll start with you, Vernon. Do you have any last bits of advice? Uh, I think uh, pretty much everything was covered during this uh, webinar. Uh, in case uh, you have uh, questions, you can always uh, join the WhatsApp uh, groups that is mentioned in the slides and then uh, you can shoot out any questions and we'll be happy to answer them. Okay, great. Yash? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, congratulations, everyone who have received an admit and all those who are in the process uh, of getting one. Uh, UF is a great university. Uh, you know, you'll have a really good time here, uh, both academically and uh, like in other perspectives. So yes, just looking forward uh, to seeing you guys here. Yeah. All right. Saj Sajid? Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, congrats, everyone, for your admit, and a big congrats to have decided for the people who have decided to attend your for the graduate studies. You have made the right choice, though you need to get that for sure. And there are tons of opportunities lying here. You're on the other side of the world with, a, with your degree in hand. Don't worry about the job. There are plenty of jobs, internships for almost every student, regardless of department. And there are you know, hundreds and thousands of people willing to help you on every step. Do not get stressed. Just no, make sure you reach to you safely, be safe and. Great, Rishi. 
yeah um, actually uh, congratulations all uh, for your admit uh, so uh, like hope uh, things get better as you guys going to come here and um, you guys are like so fortunate and because uh, you guys are going to receive a lot of help from uh, the amazing support you have here so don't worry and um, you can reach out to any of the panel members here or um, any of the alumni or even any of the alumni who have passed out or the current students here so feel uh, free to reach out and uh, don't assume things and feel free if any concerns feel free to reach thank you um, great thank you okay does anybody else have any last parting words before we wrap up sorry i just wanted to mention uh, something that i forgot to mention before um, for students who are concerned about not being able to arrive on time um, it might be department specific but normally you're allowed to defer for up to a year so if you have any issues, if you're unable to obtain the visa, something like that, contact your department and you can ask for a deferral, at least, at least for the EC department, you're able to defer up to one year. Um, a lot of you, uh, well, a couple of you asked about um, seeing next steps inside of your uh, application checklist. Um, for the final documents of a couple, copy of the degree certificate and the final official transcripts, you can bring those with you when you arrive to Gainesville. Um, make sure that you submit them to the Office of Admissions, that they're still in their original sealed envelopes, and make sure that you submit those by about September, October. That won't um, keep you from registering for fall 2022, but if you don't submit them by September, October, you'll get a hold on your um, record that will prevent you from uh, registering for the next semester. So make sure that you get those in. If you have any questions for me, I'll leave my um, email in the chat, and congratulations to everyone. Okay, I think we've uh, discussed er everything possible today. So thank you so much to all of our panelists, our staff and departments, our faculty, our current students that are here giving up their time. Um, we, uh, we hope this has been really informative and, and uh, answered all the remaining questions that you have and alleviate, alleviated any concerns that you might have. We'll have the slides and recordings up tomorrow and I'll send another email out if you have any questions, you know, lots of people to contact now. So we have lots of students here from India. Uh, I talk to them all the time. They all seem to have just a great experience and love it here. And we all know and believe it would be the same for you. So we hope you choose Florida for the fall and we see you then. So until the next time, we wish you all well and thanks for attending. Go get us. <laughs>